Okay, so let's go ahead and put these five replacement rules into practice here in some proofs, again, which is going to be reflective of really the bulk of what you'll see on the next exam. And so we'll do one of these problems here. This is um, from uh, exercise set three um, in uh, 6.3, and then we have another one over here as well that I'll get to in a few minutes after we get through this one. So um, just to remember, remind you of the kind of a procedure here, so you always want to begin by looking at your conclusion and finding the pieces in the premises, right? So H and A, in other words, and we find H and A over here, so that's good. Um, again, remember, if there ever is something in the conclusion that does not show up in any of the premises, uh, that doesn't mean it's the impossible problem. Uh, it simply means that um, we're going to have to do addition then to add in whatever item might be in the conclusion that's not in the premises. At this point then, it doesn't look like addition will probably be something we have to worry about. Okay, having done that though, when I look at one and two here, right, and I know we've just learned about f these five replacement rules, and we'll add five more in 6.4, even though you might be eager to use them, it's important to recognize that your first impulse, whenever you're doing a proof like this, your first impulse should always be, um, let me just do something here real quick. There we go. It should always be to use a rule of inference, a rule of inference on your premises, that is, Modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, any of those first eight rules that we've lo looked at already, you want to use those first, and that's because they get more work done. They get you to your conclusion more quickly, typically, uh, than simply using replacement rules. So always make those your first impulse. Having said that, looking at one and two here, right, obviously we've got a P horseshoe Q, and remember that the main operator that's going to be most important, P horseshoe Q, and then down here in the second uh, um, line, we have kind of the opposite of uh, that Q there, but not exactly, right? So the opposite of that tilde A would not be A, but it would be double tilde A. Of course, we can get that with double negation. This is a wonderful use of double negation. You take something without any tildes, you add two tildes to it, and this is particularly helpful here because we've got P horseshoe Q, Right, P horseshoe Q, and here's Q again with a tilde in front of it. So P horseshoe Q and tilde Q is the setup for modus tollens, and modus tollens then would give us tilde H. And that's modus tollens one and three, giving us tilde H. All right, so now, So now, um, we obviously, once we've used both premises, we want to look at the conclusion to give ourselves a better sense as to, well, what are we trying to accomplish here? Obviously, we're trying to get the H and the A together here, right? We need to bring them together. We've got an H here, we've got an A there, or this, this A here as well, um, and we need to bring those together. Now, I want to note here that in this conclusion, the H and the A are together, and they're connected with this wedge here. So We can observe that, but this is a really important point. Um, what is going to bring these two pieces together, the H and the A? Well, when you have both pieces, when you have both pieces like we have here, you want to use conjunction to bring them together. Sometimes people have a temptation uh, to use addition to bring two things together, but really that's not what addition is for. Addition is for when you have something and then you can add on whatever you like. Since we already have the pieces, the H and the A, bring them together with conjunction. So which pieces do we want to add? Well, we've got tilde H. And when I say add, I should have said con conjoin here, right? Because we're not doing addition. Which pieces do I want to conjoin to one another, bring together like that way, or, or glue them together is usually how we refer to it. Well, we have tilde H. What if we glued it together with double tilde A? Now, you could also glue it together with the regular A there, um, but gluing it together with double tilde A is actually going to be a bit more efficient uh, because what we're going to end up needing to do here, now that we have them glued together with a dot, is we need to turn that dot into a wedge. And obviously, there's going to have to be some maneuvering of tildes here as well. So, how do we accomplish that? Well, when we have tildes and dots, right? Well, tildes and wedges or tildes and dots, we would use De Morgan's to uh, maneuver that, we could say.
And so we take a tilde from each piece, put it outside the parentheses, and then that changes dots to wedges. That's how De Morgan's works, right? Dots always turn into wedges. Wedges always turn into dots. So we have gotten the two pieces together with conge, and then we've been able to turn the dot into a wedge with De Morgan's. And what do you know? That's our conclusion. And so we're done with that one. OK, so having done that one, we can turn to this next one here that I've written already. Um, and so again, same procedure though. We have three premises, and our conclusion is s dot j. Um, the first thing we want to do is look at our conclusion and find it in the premises. So s and j, uh, there's an s, there's a j. So we'll get them out of there somehow. Uh, addition probably won't be necessary in this case. So we won't worry about the conclusion though, right? Once you find the conclusion in the premises, don't worry about it. Set it aside. Uh, focus on the, the premises themselves um, and see if you can get them to work together. And again, I will remind you, try to use a rule of inference first as opposed to a replacement rule. I say that in particular because, in fact, I probably want to resist the temptation here to look at tildes and wedges and think, ah, De Morgan's, right? I am a fan of De Morgan's. That is a setup for De Morgan's. And, and I want to do that, and I will do it. However, I don't want to let something elude me, and that's the fact that right here, right, we have the setup for hypothetical syllogism. And so hypothetical syllogism being one of the rules of inference is something I actually want to capitalize on first. And so just to remind you, with hypothetical syllogism, once you notice those two things are the same, they're going to go away, and then the, whatever's on the left, in this case S, stays on the left, whatever's on the right, in this case K, stays on the right, and then the thing that's the same goes away. And so that's hypothetical syllogism two and three. And again, in case you're wondering, well, why do that? Why do that? Again, the answer is because I can, uh, because if I'm using a, a rule of inference, it gets more work done, and so I try that. Now, at this point, there's not, you know, I can't really do anything with that. We do know we're going to use every premise we're given at least once, and so here I am going to try and apply De Morgan's to that. And of course, what De Morgan's does is it takes that tilde, applies it to both pieces, and the wedge turns into a dot. And what's better about this is that this is not only De Morgan's, but it's my favorite version of De Morgan's because I end up with a dot there. And the reason it's my favorite then is because I can simplify. And I can do com and simp off that one as well if I like. So I simplify and get tilde j. Is tilde j going to be helpful to me? You bet, right? It's right there in my conclusion. So I've gotten that piece of my conclusion. But I also need to get tilde s, right? And so now that we've used all our premises, right, as of line 5, we're reflecting on the conclusion a bit more. We want to get the tilde s, we want to get the tilde j. I will just note here, and you probably already realize this, but anytime you're trying to get two things stuck together with a dot, all you need to do is get each piece and then glue them together with conge. And that'll do the trick. So you've already got one piece, the tilde j there. Now we want to get tilde s. Well, there's this line. We haven't used line 4 yet. So we're going to pay particular attention to line 4. And we're going to note we'd like to get the s out of there with a tilde. But to do that, what we'd need to do is get tilde k, right, and use modus tollens. Well, there's the tilde k there. So what we'll do is flip that around with commutativity, right, to do simplification to get that, these pieces isolated. We always have to get the piece that we want isolated on the left. And that allows us to get tilde k by simplification on 7. And now, looking at 4 and 8 here, that's p horseshoe q and tilde q. That is definitely the setup for modus tollens, giving us tilde s. Notice Tollens 4 and 8. And how do we get the conclusion, tilde s dot tilde j? Well, anytime you're trying to get two things stuck together with a dot, just get each piece. And there they are. We'll just mark them here. There's the tilde s. 
There's the tilde J. We glue them together here. Conjunction of six and nine gets us tilde S dot tilde J. Sometimes there's a question, uh, can you glue these two pieces together in any order that you like when you do conjunction? Can you put the pieces together in any order that you like? And the answer is yes, any order that you like. And so just put them in the order that they are in the conclusion, and uh, we've done it.